So in this vlog, we're gonna look at how do we write a clear, concise, but complete audit finding. So obviously within our organization where we're conducting internal audits, we're gonna to have to be, make ourselves aware of what our audit finding categories are. Most organizations are, we're gonna need at least one category for conformance and at least one category for non-conformance as well. Most organizations have other categories as well, opportunity for improvement, which is just, it's not a non-conformance, it's just a suggestion that team might wanna consider, but ultimately they could take or leave that opportunity for improvement. Similarly, an observation is just a finding category where we're just noting that we observe something on the day of the audit as much as anything. Okay, so look at your finding categories, how they're defined, at least under the ISO management system standards. By non-conformance, the term does have a bit of a negative connotation, is simply defined as non-fulfillment of one of the requirements we're auditing against. For either a conformance or non-conformance, let's look at how to write a statement that's clear and concise and helps us you know, maximize the chance that the auditees understand what the binding is. So number one, two critical elements that must be in any non-conformance or conformance statement is we have to give some reference to the requirement as well as we do need to cite well, what was the evidence that demonstrates conformance or non-conformance against the, that requirement. They're fundamental and both of those elements must be reflected in your conformance or non-conformance statement. Before we dig into that too much, a couple of tips. By complete but concise, we need to state this and, we, and I'll give you an example in a moment and we need to state the supporting evidence across the two here, one or two power paragraphs maximum. If we're getting any further than that, if we've written two pages, the risk is the auditees will look at it and go, well, hang on, I'm not quite sure what we haven't conformed with, or even I'm not sure what the evidence is. Particularly with that first one, if we've written two pages, the risk is they don't understand what they haven't conformed with and they start to go and take corrective action on the wrong thing. The other big tip is be specific with both of these, the requirement and the evidence. Why is it exactly is it required? Simple example, we've got a purchasing procedure that says purchase orders over $10,000 must be signed off by the general manager or above. I don't just say as per purchasing procedure. I'll be specific if that's as required by 16, Point one C of the purchasing procedure. That's what I put in there. As required by 16.1C of the purchasing procedure, not all purchase orders over $10,000 were signed off by the general manager. The latter half there is the tip. I'm using the words out of that team's own procedure. That saves the situation where the auditees might say, well, hang on, why are you making us do this? No, I'm not. That's what your own procedure states. If we're not absolutely specific, we might have a 10, 15 page purchasing procedure. The team we've audited will pick it up and they will pick out the wrong clause and start trying to take corrective action on the wrong thing again. That is the risk. It's also a good road test for ourselves as the auditor, particularly if we think there's potentially a non-conformance finding. Well, number one, we can't call something a non-conformance unless it's specifically required somewhere in that procedure or the audit criteria. I have seen auditors fall into the trap, here's something I think they should do in their purchasing process, or here's something I think they could improve. No, unless it's specifically required and we can trace back to it, then it shouldn't be a non-conformance statement. Okay, maybe an opportunity for improvement if you think they could do something better. With our evidence though, again, we'd be very specific. What exact purchase orders demonstrate that some of them over the required amount, $10,000, are not signed off by the authorised person. So we'd be specific, we say, for example, purchase order 16 and purchase order 25. What we don't want to say is the evidence is some of your purchase orders, they might have a big drawer or a big electronic folder of hundreds of purchase orders. Again, we don't want them looking through, picking out the wrong purchase order and fixing the wrong thing. This method is complete, it's concise. We in order to see it expressed like that too, if I want to argue with this audit finding, but clearly it's required, clearly there's evidence, there's no wiggle room for me to argue in. It's pretty clear it's a non-conformance statement. Take the same pattern with your conformance statements. You can reverse that as well. You can sometimes start with the evidence. 16 and 25 were cited, over $10,000 not signed off by the general manager as required by 16.1c. If you found this video valuable, you may also benefit from my other HSEQ videos. Click on any of the videos on the screen to view them. They will help you on your road to becoming a HSEQ compliance rockstar. I know achieving certification to various standards is challenging, but I want to help you become confident in your HSEQ compliance.